Non-parametric tests are advantageous in certain ways in that they don't require us to assume that the data has a normal distribution, nor do they require us to assume that the sample mean has a normal distribution. The Wilcoxon rank sum test is an analog test to the two-sample independent t-test. The two-sample t-test tested for a difference in means between two populations. The Wilcoxon rank sum test does not specifically test for a difference in means. Rather, you might say it tests for a difference in distribution, or you might say that it tests for a difference in medians. We use a gas mileage example today to talk about how we can use the Wilcoxon test and the t-test to test for differences in two populations and highlight some of the differences between the two tests. Here we have a data set of 24 cars that were tested for gas mileage. The first 12 were given the first additive and the second 12 were given the second additive. The question is, is there a difference between the effects of additives? Let's first do the Wilcoxon test because this is a new test for us. Most non-parametric tests aren't based on the actual values of the data, but rather the ranks of the data. So the value that is the highest value in the data set will get the highest rank. Since we have 24 cars that are ranked, we would expect the highest gas mileage to get a rank of 24 indicating that it gets the most points, you might say, or just the highest rating for being the highest value in the data set. The test will then be conducted based on the ranks. Here I have two columns set up to measure the ranks of each observation in the data set, and Excel has a neat formula for me to find those ranks. I want to figure out the rank of this first gas additive, so I'm going to use the rank formula, equals rank. Parenthesis, I want to find the rank of this number from among this data set. Notice I put in the first value here for the first car, and then this is the group of all data points in the set. So I'm ranking it among its group. I'm going to put dollar signs around my letters because that will enable me to copy this formula down later without adjusting it for each sum. Finally, the last thing I want to do is I want to put in a 1 because I want my order to be ascending, which would give the highest values the highest numbered ranks. Notice that this very first observation receives the 10th rank, meaning it's the 10th lowest. I'm now going to copy and paste down to all cells for all possible ranks. There. I also want to do it in this column. So I'm going to copy, control C and control V, and copy this one down. Here I have all the ranked cars in terms of their gas mileages this from the first group, and this from the second group. The Wilcoxon rank sum test now requires that we add up all of the ranks for the smaller sample size. Since these two sample sizes are equal, we can just add up the first column by default. So I'm going to say that my sum of ranks is equal to the sum of the first column. And that becomes my, test, my testing rank sum. My two sample sizes are 12 and 12. And now I get to the point where I have to calculate some important numbers so I can calculate my test statistic. The expectation is what I would expect if both populations had about the same gas mileages. In other words, if all the cars had about the same amount of gas mileage from each group, this expectation would be what I'd expect from the sum of these ranks. We can calculate that formula, and it should be in your book, by doing the first sample size times the first sample size plus the second sample size plus one. So again, you see where the parentheses go here. So the addition happens first and then the multiplication and then divide by two. This indicates that from a two sample sizes of 12 and 12, we would expect the average number of the ranks for the first group to be about 150. Notice we got 180. So our sums for these ranks in group one were a little bit higher. The next pertinent question is, are they higher enough? To figure out if they're higher enough, we have to calculate our standard error. The standard error is a slightly longer formula, but I'll show you how to do it in Excel. The standard error is the square root of the first sample size times the second sample size times, in parentheses, the first sample size plus the second sample size plus 1. We now divide all of that by 12. 
there's your standard error. The test statistic is now going to be equal to the difference between our sum and the sum that we expected under the null hypothesis divided by the standard error. This is a z-test statistic. In other words, this test statistic has a normal distribution. We set up the test ignoring distributions, but we're actually going to use the normal distribution to now evaluate the p-value. The p-value in this case will equal 1 minus norm dist. This gives us the probability from normal distributions. 1 minus norm dist of our test statistic with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 and 1 for cumulative. So again, that's our test statistic, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1, and then 1 just indicates the cumulative distribution. Our p-value in this case is 4%. In this case, we can say for a one-tailed test that additive one has a statistically significantly greater gas mileage than cars with additive two. Originally, if we were doing a two-sided test, in other words, if I had asked you to test two directions, asking for testing whether or not there was a difference between the two groups, then you would have calculated your p-value to be twice as much as that p-value. In this case, let's assume we're doing a one-sided test and that our p-value is 4%. Now I want to compare the results here to the results of a t-test. This will be a good reminder on how to do a quick two-sample independent t-test. We go data, data analysis, and down here we have a t-test two-sample assuming unequal variances. I'm going to enter my variable one range. I'm going to enter my variable two range. My hypothesized mean difference is zero, that there is no difference. I have selected my column titles, so I'll click labels. And I'll put the output right over here next to our Wilcox and rank sum. Notice that the p-value here in the t-test is very similar to the p-value we got in the Wilcoxon test. Many times these two tests will agree. Let's do a second example quickly to show when these two tests don't agree and perhaps one reason why the Wilcoxon test may have a slight advantage. Let's quickly do the Wilcoxon test again. This may appear to be the same set of data, but we're going to get a different result and then figure out why we got a different result. So first, my sample sizes are 12 and 12. My ranks, I'm just to remind you how the rank formula works, equals rank of this cell, comma, from among all of these, comma, one for ascending. The last thing I need to do before I enter is put dollar signs around my group of data, the B18 cell all the way down to the C29 cell, so that they don't move when I move the formula. Now I can copy Control C, I can select all, tw all 24 cells and then paste. Now let's look at the sum of the ranks. Again, because the sample sizes are the exact same, I can pick either column to do the sum of the ranks. Now my sum is 177, so something obviously changed because my sum is different. My expectation can be calculated in the same way as before. Equals the first or smallest sample size times the sum of the two sample sizes plus 1, all divided by 2. So my expectation is still the same, and that's true because the two sample sizes haven't changed. My standard error will be calculated as the square root of the first sample size times the second sample size times the sum of the sample sizes, in parentheses, plus 1, divided by 12. So my standard error and expectation don't change. What has changed is something in the data. My test statistic is calculated as the difference between my rank sum and my expectation divided by my standard error. My test statistic is still pretty extreme, and we can calculate a p-value using 1 minus norm dist, putting in our test statistic, mean of 0, standard deviation 1, cumulative. And our p-value didn't change all that much. We went from about 4% to about 6%. Now typically, if it crosses over the 5% barrier, then we know that we are no longer rejecting the null hypothesis.
For the sake of this test, let's assume that alpha was listed at 10% or 0.1, in which case we would still be rejecting the null hypothesis for this test. Now let's run the t-test to see how the results change for the t-test. Again, recall that the Wilcoxon test results didn't change, especially if alpha is something like 10%. We got very little difference in any of the output here. Let's go back to data, data analysis, and let's run our t-test. Here, variable range one, I need to make sure I select a new variable range one. Variable range two, a new variable range two. Still have the labels still have a hypothesized mean difference of zero, and now I'm just gonna put my output next to the new test. Check out the p-value for this test. p-value jumped to 20%. We are not going to be able to reject the null hypothesis even with a 10% alpha or a 10% error tolerance. In this case, the p-value for the t-tests changed by a lot. It changed from about 5% to about 20%. However, the p-value for the Wilcoxon test only changed from about 4% to about 6%. We saw a much less extreme change. If we analyze the data a little more closely, we'll notice that one of the cars in the second data set had a gas mileage of 237, which is obviously a misprint. It's a data error. That car should have gotten 23.7 miles per gallon. In this case, what the Wilcoxon test was able to do is essentially ignore the outlier data point that was obviously an error, or mostly ignore it. Granted, there are a lot of better methods for finding errors in the data, but in this case, the Wilcoxon test shows us that it is not particularly sensitive to an outlier data point. Sometimes outlier data points show up because they are errors. Other times, outlier data points show up because they are actual members of the population. In this case, the Wilcoxon test shows us that it is less sensitive to these outlier points, and that can be a valuable trait for a hypothesis test to have.